Brain Chat is now officially live with our guest this week. So, who are you and what do you do? My name's Alan Campbell and I am the uh, British uh, single sculler. Um, and I've um, been sculling now for uh, 10 years on the team and I've uh, been to three Olympics and currently in preparations for Rio 2016. That sounds like you're a busy man. So, Alan, our first question came from Chris in London. At what age did you think you could represent your country at the Olympics or the Worlds? Um, well, I, I, the, first, the reason I took up rowing in the first place was having watched Atlanta 1996 and uh, Sir Steve Redgrave and Sir Matthew Penson bringing home the gold medal in the men's pair. And they were the only, t um, only uh, competitors for Team GB to bring home a gold medal at those Olympic Games. And I remember the pressure they were under and it was, you know, quite monumental because obviously there had been the problems with the, the bomb in the village the night before. Team GB were having an absolute and, nightmare. Uh, and they went out and smashed it. And um, when they came into the landing stage, um, they were surrounded by reporters. And Steve Redgrave obviously said the famous line, if you ever see me getting back in a boat, you have my permission to shoot me or, or something along those lines. Um, and I think at the time also, I, I desperately wanted to be a rock star as a kid. And when I saw that, I thought they looked total rock star. Um, so uh, that's what decided it for me to start rowing in the first place. And I took it up the very next term at school. Um, and then I think I never really imagined that I was going to take it to, to these sort of heights. Um, I think I just, you know, I just didn't, I wanted to row. I, you know, I enjoyed when I first started. And it kind of was just a natural progress, but I mean, it wasn't until I was at university with the army um, that you know I I looked at the possibilities, and it was really meeting Bill, um, my coach Bill Barry, in 2002 that he said, you know, if you're really serious about this, you can go as far as you want to go. And uh, I thought, you know, why not win a gold medal in the single skull? Fantastic! That's an awesome answer. I think you might be a little bit wrong about that Steve Redgrave quote because I think that was after Sydney, but. <laughs> You're right about the inspiration. He's an amazing man. Oh, uh, well, I think you know he said it in the pair, and that was why the whole controversy was about him coming back for Sydney. Then, uh, so it was. Uh, although, if somebody had seen him in a boat after Sydney, I'm sure he would have been happy <laughs> to show him. So, would have. <laughs> Moving on to some uh, discussions about uh, your training during the competitive season. What does your breakdown of low versus high intensity training look like? Um. To be honest, I, you know, it it feels like 99% is low intensity and there's only really 1% of high intensity. But um, I think obviously the proportions are a lot different. And but during the winter, um, obviously it's it, it's all about trying to get the mileage in, get the, the strength back, and um, you know to build up that big base. Um, and then really only before we start to get into racing in the summer. Do we start to do sort of more high intensity stuff, um, and relatively almost when we're doing trials in April, uh, we've only done a very short period of intensity before it, and that's almost like a start of the build up of high intensity work, um, and then you know, and, and pretty much you feel tired the whole way through the season, until you get to pretty much the last week before the World Championships, and then you start to feel fresh, and you go, I wish I could feel like this the whole year round of my training, but. You know, it's just you're constantly being sort of pushed hard, and uh, so I would say majority of it is all low intensity. Um, so, but it, yeah. so last weekend you raced at uh, Boston. You did a five k time trial. What sort of ratings were you doing then? Um, I was actually rating thirty two. Um, uh, we the the first bit. Um, I, I don't know if you know Boston or, or your listeners obviously have know Boston, but basically it's a five k course. But there is a corner in it. There's a bend, uh, a halfway, pretty much. And so for the first half, we had a crosswind. And then for the second half, it was just a straight headwind. And um, pretty much I kept about 33 in the crosswind and then 32 into the headwind and uh, just had to keep it loose and relaxed. Mm -hmm. Now, moving on, question from Ali. Can you share a few of your favorite training drills for sprint races? Um, I was thinking about this actually because I, I saw some of the questions there um, be before obviously we came on tonight and um, uh, one of the ones I, I really like to do is roll ups um, so obviously just starting at the, the backstops uh, coming rolling up forward and placing the blade in 
But then I do it at three different speeds. So it's not just a case of just doing it very, very slowly and very controlled, but then starting to build up the speed quicker and quicker. So almost when the last one, the last set you're doing would be the equivalent of like doing rate 40, where you're really sort of like really sprinting up into the front. And that, for me, you know, gets that precision on the front end to try and you know build up that catch because obviously that's where the, the whole stroke builds from for, for, for me in my mind and uh, then the other one is for when I want to change the gear and speed um, I practice um, the, the, again different speeds with the arms only and then body rock and building up from the back end just only up to quarter slide but you try to get up towards 65-70 um, mm -hmm. on those exercises and stuff so it's, and that's all about trying to maintain real good speed around the back end and then also real good precision on the catch at the front end with the, the roll up drills So really high rate but then actually not moving the boat because you're just doing the roll up Exactly, yeah um, and that's so yeah, just doing the roll up you're not taking any power, not taking any stroke um, and I would say that the you know for me I think the important thing there is that um, if you try to jump on the boat and try to get onto the par, um, then you're not getting full grip of the water, so you're not. So the idea is just make sure you go up, drop it in. You know, coaches say uh, the world over, uh, you know, catch last thing in the way forward, not first thing in the way back. And so that exercise is all about catching last thing in the way forward, and then you do the drive. Yeah. So, moving on to talking about the drive, this is a question from Elizabeth in uh, Pittsford in New York in America. She says, on the drive, do you push off with and stay on your toes and accelerate, or do you go directly to your heels and push off explosively from the start of the drive? Um, I think the, the important thing, first off, is to make sure that the, um, your posture of your, like, your body um, is in the right position. So I try to make sure I'm actually really sitting up and driving the bum into, like, br drawing the bum to the heels as I come forward into that. So then when I drive off, it's this, the seat that moves away, um, but with with the body. And so the, 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 it is mostly on the ball, the foot to begin with, but then it comes down onto the heels and then drive off the heels. So the initial part there is also making sure, obviously, good posture into the front You've got that good strong position in the body to pick up. You're on the balls of the feet, and then you gradually come onto the ball, onto the heels, and then j just drive the legs down as quickly as possible, and trying to get that acceleration with the knees dropping all the time, dropping down quickly. Fantastic. Next question from Robert, who asks, "How do you approach the front end in order to ensure a good catch without disturbing the run of the boat?" Um. So we do um, we do biomechanics quite a lot, and um, obviously we, we we use um, we use biomechanics as a way of obviously trying to sort of see how efficient we can move the boat, and you know what what makes effects on you know what has a good effect, what has a negative effect. And one of the things I've uh, I've noticed is that um, you know if there's there's a massive deceleration as you come into that catch into the last bit, but actually on the velocity curve you'll see that the boat actually does accelerate after the finish or the, the boat um, the boat is always picking up speed um, from the finish as you come forward it's only on sort of almost the last two or three turns of the wheels where the, the velocity starts to drop off but then there's a massive deceleration and the important thing there is to try and minimize not, uh, uh, not to worry so much about the depth of the deceleration but the width of the deceleration, if that does that make sense? You're going to have to explain the, so, the curve. It's a, it's a graph you're visualizing, is it? Yeah, so I'm visualizing the graph. So if you think of the way the boat ebb, uh, ebb and surges, so it's just in a normal sort of wave formation, with a, obviously with a nice uh, long top like uh, peak on the curve, and then there's a small dip as you obviously come into the catch, you pick back up, and then it comes back up onto that curve. So it's flat tops, very small little peaks in, or troughs in between. Yeah. Um, but the, the, accel the acceleration is, um, there's like, obviously when, that, when that's going, that, that velocity is going down, there's a massive deceleration. Mm -hmm. what, what I've noticed is that whenever uh, the, the deceleration will happen, there's no way you can prevent it. 
But the important thing is to make sure that you're decelerating for a short period of time, not for a long period of time. Quite often people have been worried about um, how big the deceleration is, mm -hmm. but uh, it's been more noticeable that you gain more speed by, by keeping the deceleration to a short period of time as opposed to a long. So um, I think that my approach really on the catch is that if it starts to decelerate, go with it and, and almost rush it a little bit because then the quicker you can get back on to accelerating that boat back up, the better. So don't really waste time. Don't hang around. Um, try and reduce the, the time that it has to decelerate more than anything. I, I know that sounds a bit odd, but if I could show you on a, on a graph as such, it might, might make a bit more sense. It might. No worries. Now we've got a question from Ronald, who's from Porterdown. And he says, to encourage young single scholars in training, what three aspects of training would you recommend them to concentrate on? I would say, um, obviously, water work would be one of the main things um, because, you know, th there is something very fun about being out in the water. Um, I would then say crew rowing. I don't think necessarily being in the single all the time uh, is the best thing, especially if you're quite young because, well, <laughs> not everyone will win and only a few will be win. And I think those that win at the top, they're obviously encouraged by that and they'll want to keep going. Those that aren't winning all the time, it can be a bit depressing. And um, I think then it's important that they get a taste for crew rowing and actually, you know, also feeling what it's like to row with other people. Um, so water work, crew rowing. And then I'd say the other aspect is, um, you know, I, I just keep it fun. Um, do stuff on the erg. Um, and, and I mean, when I say do stuff on the erg, I mean sort of like sprint racing and, you know, get that competitive element going. Um, try to build that up and also you know show them the correlation that the more you put in the more you get out so if you want to hit a target on the ergo obviously you have to train in order to do that and I think just trying to teach kids young scholars that aspect because there are no real shortcuts I mean it is just a lot of work mm -hmm. um, I mean for, well, for me definitely uh, it's all been about just putting in the hard graft the hard miles and uh, I have to say early on you know, my coaches when I first started rowing at school, that was one of the things they taught me was, you know, that I had to come up, I had to put in the time, I had to put in a lot of effort. Um and um I have to say I'm really thankful to to those coaches for, for teaching me the value of that. Um and that stuck with me all the way through. Isn't it interesting reflecting back on the key moments that came when you were actually quite new to the sport? I was very fortunate once to meet your school rowing coach and what an inspirational guy, but equally, I really respect the fact that you mention him a lot and that you continue to acknowledge that he made a major contribution to where you are now. Yeah, Bobby Platt, well, he got, a, you know, he got an MBE, which is um, an honour from the Queen here in the UK um, for um, his services to sport and his services to rowing. And um, under his... Um, you know, under his guidance, there was Richard Archibald who r rode at the um, the uh, sorry, what is it? The, he rode for Ireland uh, yeah. at the Beijing Games and yeah. also yeah. Um, at, in Athens as well for the Irish Light before. Peter Chambers um, yeah. and, and myself, and then there's been a, you know a few other rowers as well that have have come through up under under that as well. So I mean, we have been very fortunate to have been connected with such a, a an inspirational character and a guy that's very passionate about the sport. Now, going on to coaches, you've already mentioned two of your coaches. For you today, what input do you expect from a coach and how do you like it delivered? And that question is from Philip in Worcester. I'm, um, um, I think, you know, it's, when I go out to, to do a race, um, I can't be in control of every aspect. Um, you know, and we talk about controlling the controllables. And it's important that when you're out there, you feel supported as an athlete and that you feel that other people have done their job to give you the, the full sort of encouragement to know that you've, you know, no stone's been left unturned. And so, I, I, you know, I expect the coach to work just as hard as I do. I expect them to be thinking about uh, their own stroke. I expect them to be um, thinking about how, you know, what advantage can we get? Where are they? Where are they? Where's the winning age? 
as such. And Bill talks about this a lot, you know, the winning age and trying to, to find what is it that, that extra element that can put us ahead um, of the opposition. Um, and, and someone that's not, you know, scared to, to, to try something different and to try something not so much crazy, but just, you know, something that's that, that can make the difference to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, I'm, I'm pretty lucky from that point of view, you know, I've, I've been very blessed for having Bill and also I've, um, got, uh, you know, I've, I've, John West now is currently coaching me. Um, and you know, he's a guy that does think about it a lot and he's got some interesting ideas and we've worked, worked well together mm-hmm. for me. Also, I think, um, I'm quite intrinsically led within rowing. Um, I think I come across quite often as a bit of an extrovert, but in a boat, you know, I actually enjoy the sound that the boat makes. Um, I enjoy getting it right. I enjoy getting the boat to move sweetly, you know, on the water. And it's just, there's no greater feeling than on a sort of like a cool uh, winter morning with the sun, you know, just breaking up through the sky. And it's just mill pond water and you just get the boat singing along and it is the greatest feeling it is. And for me, uh, you know, having someone that's driven in that way as well is important to me as opposed to someone that's like, you know, win at all cost. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I want to win. I've got a competitive element, but I'd rather do the 100% of me, my best performance, rather than, you know, do a crap performance but beat everyone. Um... Whereas I'd rather do my best performance and either that's good enough or it's not good enough and, you know, have the satisfaction knowing that it, what you see is 100% of me each time I race. That's a fantastic answer, Alan. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Now, the Sculler's Head, obviously, is a, a race that's pretty close to, uh, to your heart. You're a multiple-time winner. Why don't more of the GB squad enter the Sculler's Head? They're scared I'll beat them. <laughs> Um, no, I'm joking. Um, basically, it's um, the, the, there is a lot of racing actually. You know, we we do. You don't necessarily see the GB squad racing um, a lot, but we do do a lot of internal testing. We do do a lot of trialing, um, and I think you know there is quite a lot of intensity uh, in the program. And I think it, quite often at that time of year as well, um, you know, we're coming back in after having done obviously a summer season. And you know the body has to have a bit of a rest and relaxation and to come into it slowly. And, and the Scottish Head isn't an easy course. It's not an easy race, um, especially when you're on your own in the single. Um, you know, for me, obviously, I love to, to be able to test myself. Um, I love that, you know, I love that stretch of water. You know, it's my bread and butter. And, uh, you know, it's what I'm used to. And, I, you know, I, I like to do it. But I, I think it's not necessarily the right the right race for, for all the squad at that time of year um, to be doing. And also, we, we just have so much on our plate, um, you know, with, with all the other testing and training that has to be done throughout that year. Now, a question from Peter from Walbrook Rowing Club. What is your all-time favourite sculling event? Diamond Skulls, Henley Royal Regatta. No question of a doubt. That is... Um, I mean, I still remember when I first won it in, in 2003 and, um, you know, the, the memory will stay with me for, for, for all of my life. So it will, you know, and, and the times that I've won it and the times I've even lost it, um, I just think it's a great event. So, you know, it's side by side, it's mano a mano and it's, you know, it's who's got the biggest balls on the day sort of thing, you know, and I, I don't know, there's just, I think... Being a single scholar, you do have to have a bit of an ego. And um, Bill often says, you know, we, the single scholars, when we did the great eight together, you know, each of us had egos that could fill a warehouse each, you know. And, um, it, you know, it was very hard to obviously control that when you had all eight of us in a boat together. But I think something, an event like that, where it is one-on-one, really appeals to, to the ego in you as a, as a single scholar. Um, and so, yeah, I really like that event. <laughs> it's funny, I bumped into Bill in 2002 after you'd gone on the water for the final and I have never seen him look so nervous. <laughs> 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 you wouldn't have seen it, but I did. <laughs> Excellent. Now, a question from Paul from Camus Rowing Club. Who do you think has the best technique of the current and recent international scholars, obviously apart from yourself? 
Ah, that's a good one. I would say um, I would take different elements from each. Um, Tell us about them. I would, uh, so, I, I mean, um, I, I would say, okay, well, my, oh, it's hard to say. I would say Marcel Hacker in 2002, what he did at the World Championships that year. Um, obviously, he won the World Championships. He got a world record when he did it. Um, but what you notice when you see him compared to a lot of the other scholars in that event when he was doing it in that race was that his core was so strong and there was lots of shots from behind the boat. And some of the guys were really sort of like tipsy, you know, they were sort of like struggling a little bit. Whereas he was just like a, you know, a well-oiled German machine moving up and down. Um, and his, his core and his strength was just really, really good. Um, uh, currently, obviously, Andre Sinek, um, his, the, the way his dynamic drive is like, you know, how he drives through the stroke and from the side profile, um, I think, you know, he's really good. Um, although I'm not a big fan of his catches, I, I kind of feel he misses a little bit. Um, but then, you know, he's a different athlete to me. He's much bigger, so he is and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I quite like that element. So, do, you know, his, his dynamism. Um, and then other things I, you know, I, I look at quite often at crew sculling uh, as well. Um, and obviously, my if I could row the way the French double rowed, the heavyweight double in 2003 and 2004 rowed, I would retire the next day because that for me is the epitome of just perfect sculling. Um, the way they did it, the way they raced, the way they rowed was just poetry in motion as it was. Um, I mean, that's, yeah, that's rowing porn right there, so it is. Um, <laughs> And I think, uh, I, 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 interestingly, the catches I follow quite often, and I, I watch this video and on again, is um, the Chinese lightweight women's quad from Dorney in 2006 at the World Championships. And basically, it's these three little Chinese girls. I mean, some of them just look like they're bits of string with knots in them for muscles, basically. I mean, they, they just don't look like anything, but... They're really aggressive in the way in which they race, but their catches and the togetherness of that crew was was just fantastic. And the, the the speed at which they covered the spoon on the front end was exceptional. So it was, and I, I mean, those are sort of some of the things that I I pick up on. So and uh, I I would admire. So would it, in Scotland. Yeah, it's interesting. The year Marcel won the World Championships, I was told, was the year he trained on the Row Perfect. Now you mm -hmm. also use it, don't you? Yeah. Yes, very much so. Sorry, I'm eating a little bit of food. I apologise. Um, sorry, I took on a bit, bit of, too big a mouthful there, so I did. Um, yeah, I've, um, I, I've, I've had a problem with my, with my right knee, and um, uh, obviously I had an operation before Beijing, and it caused me a bit of problems. So, um, in order to sort of take the the pressure off, um, the, the the concept two was causing me quite a bit of problems. So I, I moved on to the row perfect at that stage. Um, but yeah, I find it a really really good method of training. I still use it today. Um, and I, I find it's a bit more similar to obviously the rowing uh, stroke itself. Um, you can tend to sort of really put the weight on with the concept two, but with the the row perfect, you you sort of have a bit more sort of fluidity in the way in which you, you move uh, because obviously if you don't do it right you either bang into the front end or bang into the back end of the, of the, the slide as such so yeah and I find it, it quite good uh, from that you, point of view. You've just taken delivery of the latest RP3S, what yes. do you notice is different about it? The foot plates, a um, lot stronger as it is. Uh, the last one I think I slightly bent the foot plates to do, but this one, it, it, I think to be honest, it, it looks like the most complete machine um, that Row Perfect have put together. And, um, you know, it, you can, it's a lot smoother. Um, you're sitting in a better position, I think, as well, a little bit. Um, and you can just feel when you're pulling on the, on the chain, it's just a lot more solid. Um, when I, I have. Been, I used um, a, a, a one from '97, Row Perfect, one of the original ones, and you know, it, the, 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 when the fan was going, it could sound a little bit rickety, so it could and stuff. But I mean, th this one is really solid, very, very smooth, um, and yeah, it's just it's a lot more solid. I mean, I, I, before I think I was possibly stressing 
from the Real Perfects I was using before, but this one, you know, it's there's no sort of real give in it at all, which is good because uh, that's more like the boat. You know, we we spend a lot of money obviously on the boats, getting the carbon, getting them stiff as possible, um, and obviously on the blades as well. And so we we want as little give as possible, so that every bit of input we put into the boat, we get as an output as well. Yeah, I can understand that. Now we're going to have a short message from our sponsors. This week, Rowing Chat is sponsored by Row Perfect, the publisher of rowing ebooks. Did you know many titles are now on the Amazon Kindle store? Our latest book is a reissue of Steve Fairburn's classic text, On Rowing, with a new introduction by rowing historian Peter Mallory. Fairburn's understanding of how to move a boat has relevance for modern coaches. In the book, he explains what coaches should look for in their athletes' body positions. Other titles published by Row Perfect are also on Kindle. These include Mike Davenport's Nuts and Bolts Guide to Rigging, Walter, Walter Martindale's Ergometer Testing for Rowers, and books by Ben Rodford, Duncan Holland, Jimmy Joy, and Mike Sullivan. Just search for Row Perfect on any Amazon store to see the complete list. Right, Alan. So here's the uh, contentious question of the moment, which has been oh, uh, sent in by John from Oxford. It's alleged you've been invited to be part of a British double skull on a number of occasions. Is this true? Um, that is, I mean, it's not a case of... Um I've been invited to be a double. I, I, there was um, leading into to London 2012. Uh, obviously, Jurgen, being the chief coach, had to look at all the possible options for his best rowers and best scholars, and he felt that the double was possibly the best option. Um, and so we explored that possibility. Um, but as it got further on, um, you know, I still wanted to have the decision whether or not to 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 do it. Um, and it was one of those things that I didn't believe it was the right thing for me. And for me, uh, leading in, obviously, into those games, I believe the single skull was the right thing to do. Um, and I don't regret that decision as well because, you know, obviously, I, I came away with uh, the first medal since 1928 in the single for Great Britain. Um, and that's obviously someone I'm hugely proud of. And so, um, you know, there is... Uh, last year, you know, I, I wanted to do the single again and um, I was supported in that. And I think, you know... Uh, as long as I continue to do a performance, I will be supported to do the single skull. Um, but, you know, I'm, it is something I need, do need to consider and look at. And I think, you know, w to see if there is the possibility of a, of a real chance of doing it. In my mind, though, I would rather, um, I want to be proven wrong in my single, first and foremost, and beyond reasonable diet and beyond the diet of myself and then I want to also be proven that the double or any other crew boat for that matter can definitely win a gold medal um, and that's I know that's very hard if I'm not doing the event but it's you know you get a feeling you know when you're in it it's like being in love as it is you know and you, you just nobody can tell you what it is but you know if you are and, you, and nobody else um can say rightly or wrongly that you are or you're not in love and I think it's that thing of I have to really fall in love um, with another boat in order to, to turn my back and uh, dump the single. So to follow up, Nicholas from Vesta says, um, is rowing in a crew boat an option for you for Rio 2016 and how serious? Yeah, it's an option. Um, it's something I, I will explore if... Um, if the single, you know, if I'm really starting, if I'm out of contention in the single. Um, but out of contention means, you know, not in a medal. I mean, last year, okay, I was fourth, uh, but I was only fourth. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't struggling to make it into the A final or anything there. Also, I'd had a long sabbatical. I'd had time away. I didn't actually join the team, like, in, back into the national program until April, uh, until after the trials. Um, and so from that point of view, possibly I hadn't trained as hard as I should have done last year. Um, but I had been, you know, I've been rowing for a very long time and I'd not really had a sabbatical in any time, in any period before that, um, apart from illness and injury. 
Um, so I think I was owed a little bit of time away. Um, and, you know, I don't regret that. So don't. I also took the opportunity during that period to go out to Rio. Um, and it was, it was actually under Bill's suggestion, you know, an encouraging action as such to, to keep me motivated um, to, to go out and see what the course was like. And once we went out there in January, I was like, I definitely want to be here for the Olympics because it was a fantastic place. Um, and you know I do want to be competing there and if I'm still good enough to do the single and the single's the right boat I'll do that and if it's not you will see me in a crew boat then. So what's the recovery time for the surgery you've just had? I don't know actually um, <laughs> it's um, it's not major it's um, very minor I've just been suffering from a bit of um, um, tendonitis and uh, we had done an injection on it to try and sort of combat the problems but um, it was still flaring up and I was able to manage it very well with obviously the support staff that we have and the, the doctors and the physios and uh, but it was felt it was better to explore um, other possibilities other options and went and saw a surgeon today and he was able to do the operation but it was very very quick very very small incision well, I, I, I've got a big bandage around the hand and uh, it looks a bit club as it does at the minute it's all a bit swollen but I think um, I'll, I'll definitely be back in a boat for the new year definitely and um, I'll probably uh, just be on the bike for the next couple of weeks and uh -huh. uh, keep my fitness up Good, now Graham from Edinburgh asks what's your favourite training session? Favourite training session? Um um, I would say two two fifty meter sprints. Um, we we do we quite often obviously when part of the speed work when we're getting closer to the um, closer to, to to the race we will start to to do um, smaller and smaller bursts and pieces and um, I always enjoy doing two fifties and if we get the occasional one hundred start session those are my favourites um, because they're they're quick they're fast and uh, you know they're they're over and they're done and it's you know it's all about just putting in the big strokes. <laughs> now moving on to some questions about motivation. Um, I suspect these are people who need help themselves. So Mark asks, what is it that motivates you through the winter? Any tips on motivating yourself as a single scholar over the next three months? I think um, I, I would say that Olympic athletes are very long-term oriented um, because they're able to you know they're they're training for a once in a four year opportunity, um, and it possibly even a once in a lifetime opportunity, and you know everything you do builds up towards that. And you know uh, the Olympic final that I did in in London, you know we'd covered you know thirty six thousand kilometers in the boat in the four year periods from from Beijing through to London. Done 800 hours of weightlifting, 400 hours of cross training, and pretty much for every second that you saw us race in the final of that seven minutes, um, you know each of the scholars, each of the each of the guys in the British team, I'm, I'm certain, and I'm certain that pretty much all of my competitors had done around about 10 to 11 hours of training for every second. So even if you go on the lower end of that 10 hours, each second was rehearsed 36,000 times, but. I can tell you that was one of the single greatest experiences of my life and being able to be in that situation and in that race um, I can tell you that the you know the uh, rehearsing it 36,000 times was well worth it as it was and so I, in the winter you know you have to realize that you're building up that for the opportunity um, to race well and to race fast in the summer and um, you know it is a long-term sport and I think you have to keep sight of what the long-term objective the long-term goal is and everything else you know and if you've been beaten by somebody the, the summer before you know you have to be in the gym and going well what's my competitor doing today and um, is he doing this session um, or is he not and if he's not then you're getting ahead of him and if you're skipping the session you have to go well is somebody else going to do this and the answer is yes most likely somebody will be doing this session and they're going to get ahead of you so you have to get yourself down in the gym lift that extra weight you got to go do that extra kilometer you've got to go do that 2k or go you've got to go do um, you know that 16 kilometers that 20k all that sort of stuff it all adds up um, and like I said there are just someone no on the uh, text chatters 
<laughs> on the text chat, someone's asking, um, what do you think is the best type of training for winter training? Can you give an example of a water piece or a session you do? Um, well, quite often it is just heavy weights and, uh, and long distance. Um, so heart rate between, sort of, for me, 140 to 150 um, for about uh, anywhere between 90 minutes and then again for another 90 minutes. Um, and that's in a single day. But um, it's always good to, to put in a few good, um, uh, you know, sessions where you're doing a, a couple of higher rate bursts. But, and I mean 21, 23. So most of that paddling is at 19. And I'd say put in a, a we call them UT1 pieces. Um, and it's just a training zone, basically, with heart rate. And so it's just a bit, bit harder. And, you know, trying to do maybe um, four times two kilometers or four times eight minutes. Um, just building up from 21 to 23 and just trying to you know get the boat singing get the boat moving distance per stroke all that sort of stuff and I would say building up distance per stroke during the winter is the big thing because then when it comes to summer you're more efficient at moving that boat. Certainly distance measured per stroke is something that uh, is reasonably easy to do if you have a GPS in your single but um, unless you've got a calibrated impeller few people in the club scene I think take notice of that sort of measurement. Well actually I'll tell you um, before any of the GPS's or the um, I had a speed coach I always looked at the distance my puddles were off my stern mm -hmm. and basically just I always tried to push my puddles as far away from the stern of my boat um, when paddling and when doing pieces and everything else and stuff um, and that's a really important thing I mean in a two kilometer race 1200 meters is spent with your blades out of the water so you only spend the 800 meters with your blades in the water whereas if you don't get that distance for stroke you can end up having to row a thousand meters with only a thousand meters to run mm -hmm. what would you rather do 800 meters for 1200 meters or a thousand for a thousand and that's the important thing and it's all about just letting those puddles move away from the end of your boat so what's kept you motivated as a single scholar obviously the other than the desire to win I think it's, you know, the, the money and the women and uh, that sort of stuff. <laughs> Got a rowing such a glamorous sport, Alan, you know. Uh, don't go to Formula exactly. 1, it's not worth it. It's, um, uh, <laughs> I, um, I'll tell you what motivates me now. Um, well, I'll, I'll start with Steve Redgrave. Um, obviously, you know, he is the pin-up for, for rowing. Um, and, and I think for a lot of Olympic sport because of what he achieved. He won five Olympic gold medals, and I know there are Olympians who've won more gold medals, but none did them over five Olympic Games. And he managed to be, you know, the best over a 20-year period, basically, there. Um, and he was, you know, on the day of days, he was able to perform, and his career is defined by being the best. For me, um, and this is, you know, during the reflective period I had after London, um, you know, I, in Athens, I was in a quadruple skull, and we came 12th. In Beijing, I came fifth, um, despite having the knee surgery and all that sort of stuff. And then in London, I got a bronze. And so obviously looking forward to Rio, the aim is to win a gold. Um, but by doing that, though, I will have had a career of constant improvement. And that is something that gives me great satisfaction um, and motivation to want to achieve. Because there are very few people that have that opportunity to have constantly improved throughout their career. And... Uh, you know, for me, that would be the perfect finish uh, to, 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 to a career um, to come away with a gold medal um, in Rio. Uh, and, and so that's, what's, that's what motivated me, constant improvement. Fantastic. Well, two questions um, on the text chat from listeners. Um, the first one, if you had a very limited amount of time, four days a week for about an hour and a half uh, during the winter, when you can't be on the water, what would you prioritize in your training? Four times, you can't be on the water. I would say um, two uh, two heavy weight sessions and then two hard ergos. Um, and that could be either doing a half hour, um, you know, uh, rate 20, but really high on the par, as, as low as you can get those splits to the point where you're, you're throwing up as soon as you get off the ergo. Um, or doing maybe something like... Um, uh, four 10-minute pieces with a 10-minute rest in between and you build the rates up as well and just building up that intensity um, and trying to build up the endurance. 
Perfect. I would say those okay. would be the sessions I do. Mm. Another question. Do you think three 25-minute pieces with rates ranging from 14 to 22 is a good idea for the winter? 14 seems very low, um, but I don't see any harm in it. I mean, again, you know, it's... I would say a lot of it is about volume and then your attitude towards that. Um, I, mean, I mean, you know, if you're just going and taking off the session, then you're not really achieving what you can in that session. Um, whereas I mean, if you're, I mean, whatever that session is, if you're just trying to do it to the best of your ability and to the highest quality, then that is, um, you know, that's a session worthwhile. Um, so, I mean, you know, you know, nearly any session that you could suggest, I can say it's definitely going to be the right thing. Um, Vince Lombardi, um, a famous um, football coach, uh, American football coach, um, he's got a, quite a few famous quotes. And I think one of his favorite quotes is, um, um, it, 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 practice doesn't make perfect, only perfect practice makes, makes perfect. perfect. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really important thing. It's, you know, it's perfection isn't, uh, an outcome it's actually an Im it's a process of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and I say that, you know that's the sort of attitude you have to take in regardless of what the session is. So what's the best way to prepare for the psychological demands of a single skulls race? Um, <laughs> I think um, it's odd because, you know, I think obviously I take quite a lot for granted quite often. Um, and I, I know that, you know, for, for, you know, when we're at the Olympics, uh, I noticed that, that quite a lot of people in crew boats felt a bit unnerved by the single scholars as we were going down for our finals day. Because I know that, you know, they were looking at us going, God, well, I'm nervous, but I've at least got a few people to share this nerves with. How are they not, like, you know, ripping their hair out? For me in that situation, obviously, I was... I was really relaxed and again you know I used the people around me I had my team my mum um, she was nervous enough for the whole of the country so I had no reason to be nervous at all so didn't um, <laughs> so I think it's about you know just acknowledging there are people there to help you uh, the support that you get and um, I think you know just ha ha like you know do your job and not not having to sort of um, to don't involve yourself too much with a lot of outside influences. Be process led. Do you know? Do the way you've practiced, and you know, just just don't make it complicated. Just keep it nice and simple. Do the job, and uh, everything will happen. The hardest stroke is always the first stroke. Get that done. The rest of it will take care of itself. I like that. So, what's your most memorable light bulb moment in training? This is a question from Sue in Barnsbridge Ladies Rowing Club. Light bulb moment. It would have been 2003, and it was the day before the pairs head in 2003. I was rowing with Mike Hennessy, so it was Trigger, as we know him affectionately at Tideway <laughs> Scullers. And um, we, were doing, um, we were doing a double skull for the race, and he was, I think, currently ranked like the fifth lightweight, and I was ranked the tenth heavyweight sculler at the time. We were going up against the Wells brothers, um, Matthew and Peter Wells, and they were ranked, I think, first and second at the time, or first and third. Um, and so it was almost like, oh, we're not going to do this. But I had been rowing like an absolute dog um, in front of Mike. Uh, I'm pretty certain there was pictures of him just with his eyes shut. And I think somebody asked him afterwards, were your eyes shut there? And he's like, yeah, because I couldn't watch what was going on in front of me, so I couldn't. And... Um, you know, it was one of those things that Bill was like, I've done everything I can do. You know, obviously the guy's not getting it. And um, Mike actually suggested we just did no pressure rowing um, and just basically just taking down all the pressure off, not trying to pull hard and feel for the boat. And suddenly I kind of, yeah, it was like, it was a light bulb moment. I, I was like, I, I can actually feel what's happening here. I can feel how I'm affecting the boat. Um, by not putting pressure on, and I could see the influence I was having sitting in the stern and how that was affecting the the, the little bit of spray, the little bit of flume that comes off the, the stern of the boat, and um, I was just like, you know, I can, you know, I, I can affect the boat so much better than I have been doing, and then we obviously built the pressure back up, and we built the rate up, and we started doing some of our best rowing and so, you know, it's still some of the best rowing I think I've done 
um, with with Mike behind me. I've always enjoyed rowing with the guy. So um, we, we the first time we won the Force Head um, was together in two thousand and six. Um, and he sat behind me then, and uh, you know he's got a real good technical eye, and um, it was just bringing all the pressure off, just going light, feeling for the boat. And I've always, re I've, you know, ever since then, I've always realised that whatever you put in, you have to make sure you're affecting the boat in the right way, and you're feeling for the boat. That's fantastic, Arthur. Thank you so much. Now we've got a question here. What's the height difference in your rigger? And, says Nick. And from we won. We won the next day. Sorry, oh, and you won even better. <laughs> so it really we won worked. The next day, and we beat the Wells brothers by two seconds. So we did. <laughs> um, and we got thoroughly drunk and had a really good time as well. So we did. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> your next question. Sorry. <laughs> so Nick from Molsey asks, "What's the height difference in your riggers?" So um, I've got you know. Again, like looking at the single scholars, we're all sort of very different body shapes. And I've actually got quite a low body. Um, and as a short body, not low body, but a short body, uh, very long legs. Um, in fact, I've even chinned myself coming forward in the boat once or twice and bit my tongue from my knee smacking up on my chin. So, uh, but, um, uh, I, so my, my riggers are set fairly low. Um, and the whole idea is to try and have a low center of gravity. Um, so I've got more balance as such in the boat. Um, but the difference is less than a centimetre. It's about 0.8 of a centimetre. Um, and again, that's all about staying low and really horizontal in the boat. Um, you know, if I had a long body like uh, Andre Sinek, I think I'd be a lot higher, maybe hands a bit further apart, and, you know, because I'd have a big swing through with the back to go. But majority of my stroke has to all come from the legs. Mm, good stuff. Um Stephen from uh, the USA in Malvern, Pennsylvania says, when you have periods of no improvement, how do you deal with that and keep motivated? I think you have to, you have to take something from it. Um, even when you've had, you know, like the worst day of rowing, you have to realize that, you know, either it was you that was uh, affecting the boat that, that wasn't going well, or it was possibly just the conditions or something else. Um, and I think, you know, you, you've got to still sort of uh, try and learn from from that. And it's like, you know, either this is working or it's not working. Mm. And, you know, over a period of time, you know, if it's not improving, I would say generally, you know, something's not right maybe in the program or something's not right maybe in the attitude mm. or, you know, there's something else. And so it's about, you know, trial and error and tweaking things to try and get yourself back onto that curve of improvement um, and everything else and you know and don't get too bogged down by it and don't overanalyze it you know if it's if you're on that line you know it's and uh, but you know tweak it a little bit see if you can influence it a little bit and once you get back on you know enjoy that as such do you train with kettlebells asked Cameron from Ottawa yeah we um, we obviously we do strength and conditioning quite a lot at this 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 time of the season and um we do use um kettlebells we don't have kettlebell sessions we would use it as uh, you know in part of our uh, in part of our training or part of our weightlifting um it's not specifically just kettlebells so we do use, like kettlebell swings um dips with the kettlebells and um sometimes single leg dips and and using the kettlebells in that way but there's i wouldn't say it's um it's like a, a big kettlebell session or anything there. Um, usually, we use Olympic bars mostly, um, you know, like you would do for squats. Mm -hmm. Now, Merv asks about protein and nutrition. She says, which protein sources should a rower use? Should they have supplements like whey protein or natural ones like egg? Well, um, the British team were actually supported by Science and Sport, SIS, um, and they're, uh, they're a company that supply a lot of, um, we get you know, the opportunity to use a lot of their different products. I, I've used some of them, um, but I, I tend to use the hydration ones more than anything. Um, and I find that, you know, I, I tend to get enough protein from from the food that I eat um be it uh, you know I do eat meat every day so do uh, at least for for one meal I have a you know good dose of either you know uh like that lamb meat chicken uh, sorry um beef or chicken or or fish um and then obviously I have milk with my breakfast in the morning to do and um drinking milk before and after weightlifting I think is really important and then 
obviously a banana as well to try and get a bit of carbohydrate in there as well. But uh, I tend to be very au naturel, so do, and would occasionally use the powders if I'm really struggling or I'm losing weight on, on a training camp if it's quite a high level of training. Alan, that's brilliant. We're just coming to the end of the uh, pre-submitted questions and we're going to move on shortly to questions from listeners. So uh, listeners, put them into the uh, text chat window. Um, now, Alan has very kindly uh, given a donated a prize for listeners as part of this uh, rowing chat. And what he's got offering is a signed picture of the very first Great Eight crew from 2009, um, signed by all the members of the crew. And he's also got a GB Rowing t-shirt from the World Championships. Now we're going to draw this as a free prize draw and everybody who signed up in advance to join the rowing chat is automatically entered in the draw and also everybody who's on the Row Perfect email newsletter list is also in with the draw and we'll draw that at the end of the month so that'll be the 31st of December. Right, let's move on to some of the uh, questions that have come through from listeners live. Um, we've got um, a question that says, do you think crews should be tested now in time for the summer? Or should the rowers be in singles until the beginning of summer and then have the crews formed, I guess, based on testing at that time? I um, Obviously, you know, it's not my job to, to, to decide how selection is done in this country or anything there and stuff. But I think, you know, that there there is a benefit to being in the singles and being in the smaller boats and obviously learning to move your boat, feel for the boat, as I, as I talked about there. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, and, and we're not really that different from a lot of other countries. Uh, funnily enough, I talked um, to Valent Sinkovic, who stroked the, the quad that I did for the Force Head just recently um, from Croatia. And he's the stroke of the Croatian um, quad that won the World Championships this year. And I was talking to him about, you know, because I assumed that they were just in the quad pretty much 24 7. They, you know, that, that was it. They were four brothers effectively, and they just, that, that's all they did. But they train in their singles. And it's only really in April or May that they get into their sit, get into the quad together. Uh, they separate it. Then they're not in the same location. They do train separately from from each other, um, and then they all come together um, at that period, and then train obviously as a quad from then on. And that's very similar to what we do in the British team. And so I, I don't really see the the issue or the problem. I think it's I think that's possibly the right way to do it. Small yeah. boats and then big boats. Okay. Now we've got a question from Stealth82, who I happen to know is Tom Carter uh, from Upper Thames. How much do you test other equipment or rigs to see if there's anything that can give you an edge, for example, new blade shapes or hull shapes? Um, so I have actually had a, I had a new hull shape sent over to me from Felipe uh, recently um, to test out. Um, but I still prefer my, my old one, the F39. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I do. I do get the opportunity to test new equipment from from Felipe, and they're obviously keen for me to do that. And currently, I'm in a process of testing. Um, I, I've been in the process of testing new blades, um, and we're actually looking at um, obviously skinny blades, uh, the thinner and thinner blades. They're now starting to become more and more available from from different blade manufacturers. So. I've been testing those out, um, and uh, as it is, I'm actually currently using a set of Croker uh, S39s, which are Croker skinnies, effectively, um, and uh, I quite like them. They've got good stiffness, similar to the ones that I've been using before, and um, yeah, obviously lower profile and everything else. So, you know, we are testing stuff out. We do get an opportunity to to try bits and pieces, um, and obviously, as a single scholar for me. It's very easy to do that because um, you know I can just uh, obviously chuck in a different set of blades and go out and try that, or get a new boat uh, and rig that up and go out and try it, and uh, and then if I like it, I can buy it um, and everything else. Very good. Now we have um, a question um, about erg scores. Do you think erg scores are important for ranking, or whether water performance is more important? Well, obviously. You know your performance on the water is is what you do get ranked by at the end of the day, um, and I'm pretty certain someone like Graham Benton actually well to be fair he is uh, the the world record holder for his age category right now at 40. So he's he's um he's the sort of the British champion and he just won the age category at 40 um, for 2k. Um, 
and he, you know, he is. He's always been renowned as a, you know, top guy in the ergo. I'm sure he'd love to give up maybe a few seconds on the ergo to be a bit quicker on the water. So he would, um, and have maybe made it into the team. <laughs> but uh, funnily enough, whenever we were training in the quad, I go back to the force head quad. The other two members, um, including Valent and myself, were Andre Sinek, obviously Czech Republic, and Alexander Alexandrov from Azerbaijan. And uh, Alexander's best. 2k ergo he was telling me was um was was basically over six minutes it's not it's not he hasn't gone under six minutes and andre um i mean his erg scores are unbelievable they would actually they would they're totally sick to be honest actually sort of thing the guy's not human so he's not at all um but he um he pretty much just said turned around to alex said well if you pull sub 550 then you will go quicker and it was kind of like sort of looking back at him and it was just like oh well, I suppose if I did pull sub five fifty, I would go quicker, and it was—it's that thing. And there is a correlation there. Um, obviously, you know, Alex is a guy that his erg score doesn't really reflect his speed on the water, so it doesn't. He is—he is obviously a very good sculler. Um, you know, he won the B final at the Worlds this year. He was in the finals, the Olympics, um, and you know, a six-minute ergo doesn't really reflect exactly where he is on the water relative. Um, but obviously, if he did improve that. Like Cynic said, he would go quicker in the water. Fair point. And our last question from the listeners. Any tips or exercises for improving balance in the boat? Improving balance. Um, I think the, the thing about balance is really not to worry too much about it. Um, I think too often people try to control too much of the stroke all you're really trying to do is take your blades out, come forward and put your blades back in. And I think if you can just simplify it in that sense of just all I'm doing is taking my blades out, coming forward and putting my blades back in and just let it happen, um, I think you'll find that you know you will get better balance um, j just from doing that. Whereas if you're taking your blades out and you're then trying to control every aspect of that boat, you're fighting, you're in a, you're in a losing battle at that point, so you are. Um, the boat does want to naturally sit balanced, and uh, I think also, um, you know, the only thing that is going to put it off balance is yourself. But if you're overworking it, over analysing it, overthinking it, um, it's it, you know, it, it's too complicated. It's not going to happen. So what I'd say is just try to really simplify it. The boat will go off balance now and again. Let it be. That's that's the way it happens, you know. And you, know, I, I obviously learnt a lot of my trade on the tideway. Um, here in London on the Thames, it's a uh, you know tidal part of river. The water rises up and down by about six meters every day. It's um, it's you know a unique experience. And Rebecca, I'm sure, you know you know it yourself, so you do. Um, and it's just the conditions are constantly changing, and you cannot control the conditions effectively. But all you can hope to do is just to do what you want to do, and you'll achieve that. And I would say, you know, the boat will now and again go off balance. Let it. You know, but on the next stroke, you know, just get back in and uh, you know try and try and not overthink it, overanalyze it. Just come forward, put your blades in, and it should be better. That's great. Now, someone's asking, what are Andre's erg scores? You've tempted us. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure he he wouldn't be. Uh, he'll not be shy. And they're they're five fifty for um for a uh, two k. Sorry, 540. Sorry, 540 for 2K. I'm, I'm, I'm doing him a disservice there, God. Um, and then his most impressive one is his 6K erg score. I don't do a 6K, I do a 5K, but his 6K erg score, um, he was saying, was 18 minutes and 11 seconds, which is the equivalent, I think, of like 130. 130s, um, yeah. Yeah, so it's, like, it's under 131. I mean, for 6K. <laughs> Is I mean that's just mind boggling. I, I can't even get my head around that, so I can't. But yeah. there we go. Now um, we asked for a shout out for my boys in Lee Rowing Club in Cork in Ireland. Could you um, could you give them a shout, Alan? Oi, oi, Lee Rowing Club, good boys. Keep it going. Stick your oar in. Fantastic, Alan Gamble. It's been marvellous having you on the rowing chat with us today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for getting with us even after surgery and uh, we really really appreciate you being here uh, it's all the in the day of a life of a rower so it is you know that's how it happens so it's one injury to the next and uh, 
our, the odd webinar here and there. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Uh, thanks for listening. I hope I haven't bored too many people and uh, there hasn't been like a down surge, you know, and, and people using the internet are like, get off that guy's online sort of thing. No, I've enjoyed it. Uh, I hope people have got something from it. And um, I, um, yeah, I hope that you all continue to support me. And I, I have to say, I am very lucky to have such great support, um, not just in the UK and Ireland, but also around the world. Um, it was a fantastic experience racing in London, knowing that 99% of the people shouting down that last 500 meter stretch were, um, were, were shouting for me. And I have to say, Lassie Corona, I've just been in contact with him today because he's just announced his retirement. Um, he's oh. not coming back to compete for Rio. Um, and he's a guy that definitely deserves a medal. So he does. Um, you know, him and me, we had a pulling contest on the last 500 meter stretch of Dorney. And, um, you know, he's 105 kilos of pure uh, Viking uh, red meat, he is. Um, but I, ha I did have the advantage of having the support on that day. Um, to make me bulk me up from my 95 kilos to be able to match him down that last stretch, um, and I have to set me a difference. So I hope that um, you will continue to support me through to Rio, and uh, I hope that I will continue to uh, to perform all the way through to Rio as well. Thank you. Fantastic. That is so good. Good night, everybody.